His life began in a refugee camp. Today, he is empowering communities with peace building through video games. Meet Luol Mayen. My name is Luol Mayen. I'm originally from South Sudan. I'm a former refugee, and right now I'm the founder and CEO of Jimu Game and a game developer. And this is my BIP story. Luol, thank you so much for being on the VIP show. You thank are you. our VIP of the day. I would like to start with something you mm. believe in. Yeah. Uh, a, a quote that you really share everywhere you go, which is, mm. true peace is built over time. Over time. Yeah. What does this mean? First of all, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be on the VIP today. It's really an honor. A lot of people misunderstand that, you know, what a true peace is. People, a lot of people think that peace is something that is signed on, on you know, on paper, uh, especially when uh, the international communities try to bring, you know, peace in different countries. That's whereby, like, they can make sure they bring the, you know, the warring parties together and sign a paperwork. That's not a true peace. A true peace is something that actually reached to the grassroots it reached to the people. What is the mindset of the people? Is a mindset of the people all about peace? Because when we understand peace as a product, when we understand peace as something that is built over time, and then we can put in more interest, we can put in more energy to use different sectors, even agriculture. You know, when people eat, and then like when, when people have all you know basic needs, that is peace building. What mm. you believe now about mm. peace, mm. it's something that you developed over the years. You yeah. were born mm. at a time of war. So yeah. take us back to that time where your mm. mother was pregnant with you yeah. and fleeing from South Sudan yeah. with your family. And you were born at the border of yeah. Uganda and South Sudan. It was terrible. And even like today I ask myself, how did she manage to, you know, to flee the country and actually making us as the children to, you know, to live in a refugee camp. They used to be farmers. They used to keep, uh, they were cattle keepers th and their life was really better. But because of that war that affected them, actually they didn't know where they were going. Mm -hmm. They were just, you know, you know, heading where they can have, you know, a place of refuge. Yeah. And uh, when they reached to, you know, to northern Uganda, you know, they, they had to settle there. And, you know, the biggest problem was just whenever these refugees settle in that, in that environment, whatever affecting that environment affects them as well. Especially the LRA, uh, you know, the large resistance army yes. in, yeah, in, in northern Uganda, mm -hmm. affected us a lot. Yeah. What was life like? I'm going to explain in two ways. One, it was the best life. Okay. Two, it was the worst life. The worst part of it is that we didn't have like opportunities to have, um, you know, to go to school and there's no food at all. I think like, you know, you don't eat. Like you, like as children, you wake up in the morning, you go to the bush and you get fruits, fruits of trees that you actually don't know. And then you start eating them because you want something to eat. You want something to sustain you for the, for the day because the food that is provided by the World Food Program it's not enough. The worst thing was health. Our education was not really, really good at all. We didn't have like, uh, you know, equipment. Like even you go to school, there are no, you know, blackboard sometime. Um, but with my family, they really worked so hard for me, like especially my mother, for me to understand what education is. Like working so hard, like sometime I could go to school and come back in, in the day and then like, you know, my mother was like, what were you doing at school? Why do you come late from school? And my mother was like, you have to go to school. No, but no matter what is not available. You she wasn't educated. Yes, she wasn't educated. Yeah, she was, she was like, no, you, you, even by herself, she had to enroll in school yeah. for her to inspire me to go to school. Okay. Like in a dull school, she would go. Then my mother would come back and say, how are you? And I could not even say, how are you doing? And I was like, <laughs> no, like if my mother could say that, like, why you not? I, well, I, can, I can work so hard. So... You talked about uh, it, was a good life. it was a very good life as yeah. well in the refugee camp. Yeah, so it was a good life in the sense of we didn't know anything better than that. Okay. It was a good life because we came out from war and we settled at a place where we have peace, where we don't see the gunshot every day. Yeah. So it was a good life for us. We never, you know, we were locked at a situation whereby we have to enjoy whatever is available for us. So we, like for me, like I had to like utilize that. I have to use that as uh, an opportunity for me 
to, to use to like, you know, because one thing was, as my parents were telling me to go to school in the refugee camp, I was thinking, okay, being a refugee was not a choice for my parents. So if it was not a choice for them, who to blame? Nobody. Second to that is because it was my home. So a lot of people think that a refugee camp is it's temporary. temporary yes. No, I've been there for 23 years. Fascinating. So for me, I had to realize that it was a permanent home for me. So if I don't grab the chance of utilizing whatever is there, where will I ever get another chance? The third thing is I have to be contented. I have to be happy with the life that I have. Because if I envision something that I cannot afford to leave, I'm going to be in that stimulation for the rest of my life. That's true. Because I cannot afford it. But if you have a stimulation that is actually focusing on you, something that is actually within you, something that's surrounding you. And attainable it's, according yeah, to yeah, reality. Yeah, exactly, reality, because yeah. that's what you can afford. That's, yeah. like, that's what you can have. I decided to teach myself programming so that I can make game for peace. I made a game called Salam. Salam is an Arabic word that means peace. So what you do as a player, you have to stop the bomb from destroying the communities. And, you know, people start playing the game in a refugee camp and bringing the people together. How did you think about starting to create games? Yeah, honestly, like, in a refugee camp, how would you even ever dream of making video games? Like, it, it was so hard. But, like, because of those three things that I, I explained, you know, yeah. being contented, you know, being, you know, believing in yourself and so on, I had to really work so hard because my main focus was I love computers and I want to do something with computers. That was, like, the first thing. The first time I saw a laptop, was 2007 during a refugee uh, verification and I was like what is that I was telling my mom like what is that and they, they say that's a laptop wow. and during that time I was like I want to do something with this around 2010 I told my mom I want to buy a laptop and she was like what you're laughing at me like what are you going to do with the laptop there's no way to charge a laptop there's no money to do it she spent almost three years buy for me a laptop and she came to me and said hey well this is three hundred dollars that's the love of a mother <laughs> that that time i don't know what i did i actually it was a very very important time for yes. me a because turning a turning point the worst thing for me was how do i use this laptop how do i give back to my mother what can i do to be able to show her that this is very vital and she has done for me something very important so one day i went to an internet cafe my friend installed for me a, a video game called Grand Theft Auto. Like it, it, it's like a, like it, it's an amazing game. A lot of people love it to play. It is a violent game. Okay. And then when I came there and I opened GTA Vice City and I, oh, it's a video game. And then I start like you know working so hard to learn how to play it. So when I start playing that game, it reminds me of what is going on in my country because it's a violent country. Uh, not taking in a way that the game is bad but taking away that if the, the children in my country start playing this game, how does that change their mind? Video games are interesting, they're entertaining, they're amazing. Like every, when you go to my country, almost 73% of the population is under the age of 30. These are young people. And these are people who could love to play video games. Yeah. And these are people that I use as a tool of war. So you saw this as an opportunity? An opportunity to make something out of it. Work so hard to get tutorials, to okay. train myself, like, okay. you know, online tutorials. I made my video game in 2016. I, I was just like having fun. I was like, you know, making a game which is simple, sending it to close friends in, in a refugee camp. And then like what happened is I, I, I post the game, I put the APK on my Facebook page for people to just click on it and download it. And then someone from London downloaded the game. There is one of the biggest news agencies called the Next Web. So this guy played the game and was like, he reached out to me wow. when I was in a refugee camp. That was the biggest turning point for me. I'm really impressed with what the game industry is doing because the game industry is one of the biggest industries in the world and it's so hard to penetrate into. It's so hard for you to have a voice. And then also my biggest fear as someone who is using game for peace and conflict resolution, that's a different there's something opposite with what the industry oh. is. So f for them to impress me, for, for them to like, 
you know, recognize me for the for me to like be in the game industry as, as someone with a voice. It gave me so much of your game, mm. which is uh, peace building. Yeah, about peace building and helping children through yeah. that. Mm. What what is in the game? What, what how is the game helping them? Uh, yeah. So right now I have three games. One is Salam game. It's 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 on mobile game. The other game is a board game, which is uh, wider, and I'm working on a VR game right now. So in the game, instead of like killing people, you save people from being killed. Okay. So there's a woman in the game, like trouble. Like there's a lot of bomb coming on to destroy the communities. But for you as a player, you have to make sure that you stop the bomb from you know destroying the community. So when you look at your journey. Mm. Uh, think about those you left behind. What would you like them to take from your story? It, it helped me so much to, to share my work and what I'm working on. So it's really given me so much hope to also talk with the refugees that you can only just survive. You can thrive. You can become a better person. You can do amazing stuff. When you look at your journey yeah. again, who do you have to thank at this point of your life? I would really like thank my mother because she has done so much for me. She has always been like there for me. And, and that's the love of, you know, of, 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 you know, like uh, African mothers, they have this zeal of working hard for their children, you know, no matter what, they, what is the situation. Well, Luo, that was wonderful. You did thank so you. well in thank the you. interview, but yeah. guess what? It's not over yet. Yeah. We have the next part of yeah. the show, yeah. which is called the VIP game. Uh, I'm gonna pick this one at a time. One at a time. Okay. So, if I could change one thing in the world, I would. Wow, that's a good question. Uh, right now, what I'm seeing in the world is we don't believe in each other's stories. Nobody care about your story until you do something about it. So if I could change anything, is to let people know that it's good to support each other okay. from the grassroots. The three words that is better to describe me are, yeah, I, one thing about me is I'm a focused person. I, I focus a lot on what I want to do. Uh, that's one. Uh, two, I love having hope because if you don't have hope, uh, you cannot achieve anything in the world. The last thing, because there's three, I'm a loving person. I, 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 I like people. I, I like my community. I like uh, all people that, are, that have the sense of uh, what it means to be a human, you know, humanity first. Uh, the other question is, my hope for South Sudan is uh, when we have hope in my country, <laughs> when we have peace in my country, when we have love in my country, the hope is that we're going to be a very great country. In my country, it's something to be proud of. Uh, we have almost 73% 70, of the population is so under 30 yeah. young people. So that gives me so much hope that, you know, we will be a great country. I see greatness, yeah. You are a true inspiration thank you. indeed, thank you. a uh, true VIP, Luol Mayen. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. In VIP Social Good, we highlight the organization Crown the Women South Sudan, a non-profit organization that aims at empowering girls and women to ensure they harness their potential and contribute to nation-building economically, socially, and politically. Established in 2016 by concerned young South Sudanese women, Crown the Women strives for the respect of women's rights, enhancement of women's security, and making women's basic needs a priority. Crown the Women has a special focus on investing in young women and children as the means of securing the future of South Sudan's women in nation building and development. For more information on Crown the Women or to support, visit their website at crownthewomen.org.